Welcome to Lafayette We're Here, the French history podcast for the American public. I am your host, Emmanuel Dubois, and today I am joined by a coalition of Napoleonic specialists. Together, we're going to have a grand discussion around everyone's favorite Corsican. I am really thrilled about this, and I hope you will enjoy it too, dear listeners. So now, I will introduce my guest, and we will all state how they got the Napoleonic era passion, how they started studying it, what they are now making with it. After that, we'll have a roundtable discussion exploring various themes. So first, from Germany, Philipp. Hello, my name is Philipp Wagenknecht. From Germany, I'm, I would say I'm the Prussian specialist here. Uh, I am working as a teacher and um, I'm writing now uh, a book on the perception and psychological impact of the war on the German and Prussian population. So thank you for having me here, and I'm very pleased to join you. Very nice. Uh, next, uh, Marcus. Hello. Uh, so thank you very much for having us on again. Uh, yeah, my name is Marcus Cribb. I suppose I started on Napoleonic. I was really lucky to actually have it in school as well as in sixth form college, which is very rare for Britain. I don't know if we'll uh, touch on this later, but it's actually very unusual. I had a very good teacher kind of drawing that passion. We did uh, both the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon, actually more than any British influence on that era. Uh, and about that time, as many people will know, I became uh, rather enthused with the books and then the TV series of Sharp by Bernard Cornwell and then starring Sean Bean. Uh, and then later, I was really lucky to get the job as the manager of Apsi House, the Duke of Wellington's home and Wellington Arch in London for over four years. And that just ignited a catalyst inside me that I wasn't even sure was fully there. And, uh, you know, getting to go into some of the private rooms and handle some of the uh, personal objects of the Duke of Wellington, as well as a large part of my job actually talking to the public about the Duke of Wellington every day. It was fantastic. And it's uh, led me on to uh, writing some books and doing podcasts and different bits. And I think I always have this interest in the Napoleonic Wars now. It's deep under my skin. So items and topics like tonight are very very interesting fantastic thank you and now john from the usa yeah john viscardo from america here and i have a podcast called generals and napoleon and what i think ignited it the interest in napoleon and the age was just uh my father used to tell me stories my father was in the u.s military and he would tell me uh stories of napoleon and it almost seemed like a storybook like you couldn't believe that this actually happened and then i taught high school uh secondary school here in the united states uh, world history and then one day i just bought a book at a book sale at a library it was a used version of um campaigns of napoleon by david chandler and i just got hooked i was sitting on the beach reading this book for five hours and i couldn't stop reading it so i just thought well i think there should be somewhat of a a, a podcast to discuss some of these interesting personalities and that's what what kind of drew me into it and here i am uh with my own little podcast so thank you for having me fantastic and last but not least zach white hi there um so yeah i'm also a podcaster for my sins uh, i run the napoleonic wars pod it does kind of what it says on the tin really it's not the most imaginative name it used to be more fancy name it used to be the napoleonicist uh which was a much more fun title, but nobody really either understood how to pronounce it, which was a problem, or what it really meant. So that kind of got sidelined because, you no know, marketing. Um, my route, well, I've been working on this kind of stuff for a little over a decade. I went to Southampton University as an undergrad to work with the Wellington Papers because they are held at the university. Started that in 2012 for the Salamanca anniversary. And I've been at it on and off ever since, with little blips in between to go and become a teacher. Uh, recently finished my PhD, which looked at crime and punishment in the British Army during the period. And that's my story, really. Um, in terms of the, the original kind of route in, like Marcus, it was sort of the, the hook was Bernard Cornwell's Sharp series. Um, I remember flicking through at sort of the age of 13, and that combined with a visit to HMS Victory, 
because I was reading Sharp's Trafalgar at the time, so it was all very pertinent. And yes, Marcus rolls his eyes because he fails to acknowledge that Sharp's Trafalgar is the best because it has the sort of 70-page naval battle at the end of it. You just don't bother reading the rest of the slow burn because it's it's a bit tedious. Um, stop pulling faces, Marcus. Um, but yeah, that, w- that was my routine. And it sounds terribly cliche, but I do remember reading the sort of the historical notes at the back of Bernard's books. Um, so, for example, Sharp's Waterloo, he does this nice little piece on the realities. And sort of thinking, you know, one day wouldn't it be fun to write something like that and then just sort of dismissing that as fancy. Um, and then ended up doing exactly that, which is very odd and sounds like something terribly Hollywood, but it, it was never sort of intended as such. Fantastic. So we're going to start so you, uh, the listeners can get to you know even better by talking about everyone's favorite subject in the period. It can be anything from a person, a battle, an event, whatever makes your heart beat a little faster when you think about the era, you know. And uh, I know we ha- people here have different opinions on different things during the, the Napoleonic era. You know, I've read and heard um, how much enough about you to know that, and it's fine. We're all gentlemen. Nobody's going <laughs> to fight each other here. <laughs> and I see Zach not being too that sure about that. <laughs> but that's fine, you know. And um, I'm the only French guy, so that makes sense. As I said, it's a coalition here. Um, but I have an ally. I have an American right there. <laughs> you never know. Anyhow, so let's get started with uh, Philip's uh, favorite subject in the Napoleonic era. My favorite subject, uh, I should say, is the uprising of 1813 and the feeling of 1813. We have a country like Prussia in that moment, which is occupied by the French. And in these years since 1807, it becomes harder and harder to be an emancipated state. And uh, the whole German population suffers under under the occupation of of the French. In, In this subject, in the last weeks, I saw Saxony as a brilliant point to to discuss that. Saxony was nearly destroyed by the Napoleonic Wars. It was a a country through which marched huge armies and uh, all this cost the people a lot of money. Uh, They they had to be housed. They they had to be fed. And and, uh, the, the... Fiercest, the brutal, the most brutal battles in the Napoleonic Wars took place in Saxony, and this is for me the the exploration and and um, the how can I say uh, the the examination of of this this impact on Saxony and the uh, the German states is for me. In, in this moment, the most interesting part of the Napoleonic Wars. Beautiful. And it's something that is not well known outside of Germany, I would say. Uh, so it's great that you push that. Like, I'm talking about my French perspective when we talk about Napoleon and the wars. Barely a mention of Germany, yeah, you know, uh, even though, you know, it doesn't make sense. We have even <laughs> a word for I, I that. Uh, it means Franzosen side, the time of the French. Uh, it, it is depicted in some 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 brilliant paintings uh, who show the dirty boots on the on the tables and and the 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 terrified people in the background and something like that. Uh, and this, I think, is the catastrophe in the morning of the nineteenth century, which then leads to all the catastrophes for Germany in the twentieth century. And uh, to to watch this. And see that is only a step. It is stairs to all that what happens in the 1870s. And and but on the same place, it is that this catastrophe only led to the unification of the German countries. Now we 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 had around 300 states, and with the Federation of the Rhine and, and the kingdoms in the south, we had 19 states, and after it. Uh, he, uh, Na- Napoleon Bonaparte created the states, the German states, to have uh, protection from uh, for Russia, for Russia, 
to defend to defend France, and uh, and this led to the to his fall. Uh, and this is the fascinating thing: a creation and a destruction, and all this led to the top to Germany. Uh, a fascinating job subject for me. Agreed, and you when you th when you talk like that, it makes me think of the Thirty Years' War. You know, a European war waged on German soil, even though it was not really the fault in the right term. But you know, it was not a war waged by the German people; it just happened to be fought on your soil with catastrophic consequences. And we have connections. We have uh, connections from from the Thirty Years' War into the Napoleonic Wars. So, uh, for not only for one example. Napoleon Bonaparte fought the Battle of Lützen. Yeah, it's, it's called Groß Gershon. Yeah, a very important uh, battle for Prussia and for Germany because it's the first battle of eman emancipation. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's after the uprising, the first main battle, and, uh, which leads to a loss. But it's still an, 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 a success. But Napoleon Bonaparte called it the Battle of Lützen to uh, to make the connection to the Thirty Years' War, in which um, there there was a uh, battle at Lützen too, uh, and and it's the same ground, and it's again the soil, the the, the blood soaked oil of of central Germany again after these years. Yeah. So thank you, Philip. Uh, next on to Marcus. And that's quite one to follow already. Uh, I guess being a bit of a stereotypical uh, Brit, it is the Peninsula War as a, as a, as a broad stroke. Uh, the Peninsula War is such a rich topic uh, with layers of both military history, uh, logistics and uh, politics, both international and internal in the in Iberian Peninsula. The stuff that really gets me kind of my heart beating is uh, probably the opening stages of the Peninsula War, the first uh, three years especially. And it's, it is quite a, a fast paced story of the, uh, the outbreak of the Peninsula War as it is, you know, Napoleon basically kidnapping, uh, house arresting the, the king of Spain, the invasion of Portugal, which de facto goes to war with Britain, but secretly keeps the alliance, uh, Wellesley coming in having victories, being recalled to Britain, and then coming back and uh, winning uh, two great victories in 1809, of which one of which is my subject of research, the Battle of Porto, which is uh, really holds history in the balance and has a moment where you have a spy, a priest and a barber crossing a river. And uh, if they'd been spotted by uh, Marshal Soult's army, uh, it would have possibly changed uh, that campaign in a, in a heartbeat. And it, and it really is kind of almost fictional stuff and it feels like a Hollywood script at times. And it, it really does quite get me excited, uh, those campaigns. And also then the part of that, and kind of to touch on some, what some of Philip said, is it starts to get quite dark quite quickly. There's first-hand accounts of the campaign of absolutely terrible let's say, atrocities on both sides, uh, largely that the French inflict upon the local population in Portugal and are witnessed both by the Portuguese and the British, and then the Portuguese inflict on the French. Uh, and some of them are almost unrepeatable, but there are French prisoners being sawed in half alive, and that's down the legs. Um, there are nuns being mutilated and cut up into trees, and then Uh, nuns and women actually doing the same back to French soldiers. It is absolutely brutal warfare. And it's kind of under this sheen of glory and gentlemanly warfare. But that sheen is very, once you start to pick at it, very quickly peels off. And I think that's the other side, if I can ha almost have one and a half, would be uh, the other thing to do. I really enjoy doing, especially on podcasts, on social media, is kind of challenging those kind of common myths and perceptions. Uh, I think they kind of can do a lot of good in engaging people into the era, but actually these, there, there's a lot that come out time and time again, uh, especially about the Peninsula War or about Napoleon, who I'm sure will, will uh, kind of mention some of them later. And uh, those are very interesting to see why they've come about or how they've kind of in, impact, like especially national myths and uh, the legacies of different uh, battles and men. It's nice that you mentioned, you know, first Germany, then the 
the war in Spain, because those two subjects are perfect examples of what we tend to forget in France. You know, when we talk about Napoleon, some people say there was a war in Spain. You know, never heard of that. Uh, we know about Russia because that did not go so well. Uh, you know, we know Austerlitz, of course. But I'm sure you would mention to the average French guy, you know, we did, you know, invade Spain and Portugal and we behave pretty badly over there. Never heard of it. And that's really interesting that it has not got the kind of the national perception. In Britain, I'd say the average person has heard of Waterloo, uh, but probably couldn't tell you much more other than we won. And then once you start to dive in, especially in that military circles, people have heard of the Peninsula War. But details about that and actually the complexities other than just battles and battles of it isn't really something that we happen to talk about enough. Uh, I, arguably, we're lucky that we do talk about the Peninsula War probably more than we talk about the Seven Years' War, for argument's sake, uh, and many others that come to mind. But it's not something that we deep dive down into. And certainly when I've spoken to uh, some very knowledgeable French people, uh, their focus is very much on Napoleon as an individual rather than the wider wars uh, I tend to find. Uh, luckily, that's not always the case. Uh, but certainly the Peninsula War seems to get a lot more focus in Britain uh, and Portugal and Spain as well. Uh, Portugal has been, they've been doing a lot of work on uh, the legacy of and including the atrocities. Some of the universities have been tracking entire villages that have been wiped out. Zach, you had something to add? Yeah, I mean, Marcus has covered a lot of it already, but I would say that it's a kind of, it's a national thing, right? So for myself and Marcus being Brits, if you want to trace the story of Britain's success, in the 19th century, you start at Waterloo and then you track backwards. And the inevitable route to do that is the Peninsula War. So if you're a Brit, then you're probably more likely to have heard of, of these battles. Um, but yeah, having just come back from Spain and Portugal, um, I'd, I'd agree entirely with what you're saying. A lot of investment has gone into um, certain locations um, for the, the 200th anniversary um, commemorations that, that came and went um, in the last decade. So there is, if you go to these sites now, you'll actually find some really nice, up-to-date and sometimes quite innovative um, experiences. So for example, at the Miro, they have this virtual reality thing that I was um, allowed to try on. It's something that they've only very recently put together. And so it's it's funny that I think a lot of this, ends, and we'll talk more about this later, I'm sure, a lot of this is tied up in the, the national story and how we as different nationalities choose to remember history and, and have been fed it to an extent, I guess. Um, because if we get into myth-busting, as Marcus says, you know, the whole Napoleon was short nonsense um, never was something more founded on, on total rubbish. Yeah, I agree. And it's right into the mid-building, nation-building that we've experienced over the last 200 years. You know, it started at this time, you know, end of the French Revolution, early 19th century, and down the line to today. And of course, we romanticize all of it. You know, uh, as you said, the horrors of war tend to be forgotten. Nice uniforms and straight lines of soldiers shooting each other and not a drop of blood, of course. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, Mel Gibson patriot type, you know, uh, completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's, and it's so easily done by lots of different nations. And not only are the um, now new experiences, but for the 200th anniversary, there's a lot of, especially in Portugal, um, a lot of uh, commemorations and uh, memorials were put up as well. And it's actually quite interesting when you think that actually memorials for 200 years ago well above you know the generations that are out of living memory and i think that's really poignant and really nice that actually nations can remember the, the not only the history but really the sacrifice of that so um yeah it's certainly a good thing that can come out of history definitely um well thank you um now john please yeah i would say my main focus or as marcus said that really gets my blood moving is the subject of the marshals of napoleon so i feel like they kind of get cast aside like napoleon did all these great things in spite of his incompetent marshals i would say it's the opposite he succeeded because of these talented men that he had working for him 
Uh, you know, he had kind men like Marshall Mortier. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Lefebvre, Monsi. He had despicable men like um, Marshall Victor. He had men of science. Uh, I would say Marmont, St. Cyr, Debu were military scientists. Looters, shameless looters like Brune, Sult, Ogeru, and uh, Masena. He had guys who just wanted glory. He just wanted, they just wanted military glory to be on a battlefield like Marshal Ney, Murat, McDonald, Lon, and Udno. And then you had shady men who didn't really know what they were doing half the time. I would put Bernadotte and Bessier in that category. You had nobles, Poniatowski and Grouchy. And then you had, I think, a guy who doesn't get enough credit. And I think there's three geniuses produced in this time. One of them was Napoleon. The other one was Duke of Wellington. And the third was Marshal Berthier. Uh, to handle the logistics of that size of an army and to know where every corps is and know where all the ammunition is and know where all the horses are. He just doesn't get enough credit for what he pulled off. And he was a supremely talented man. And um, yeah, the marshals, I could just go on and on about. But I think that is my focus. And that is a focus of my podcast is not necessarily Napoleon, but the men who served underneath him. Yeah, I think that's great because, you know, we tend to overblow the persona of Napoleon because he is a unique person, uh, you know, and we'll get back to him his his own role in the whole era you know that's there's not for nothing we call it the napoleonic era and not the berthier's era or the wellington era whatever what have you but it's it is indeed very relevant and that's something you know i don't know in england or in the u.s but in france the maréchaux d'empire the marshals of empire are quite well respected i would say maybe not people don't know them individually of course except history students but they do have some recognition so i think that's not thankfully they were not totally forgotten behind the huge figure of napoleon himself which as zach said was not that short so now talking about the uh, theme on to zach apologies i feel quite bad because i've had the mic already um in part of this you you can tell that i'm i'm one for talking on a on a podcast um so it's been really interesting actually to listen to the other folks on, on tonight and sort of see the, the themes because there's a lot of kind of focus on sort of top down so whether that's the marshals whether that's wellington or on key events you know peninsula war what's happening in 1813 in germany for me it's kind of the other way around so it's sort of the bottom up um rather than sort of grand narratives and top down history it's always been about sort of the little people, the ones who, you know, have to carry their pack for 20 miles a day. And then at the end of it, they haven't got their rations because the logistic system has broken down. Um, and then your, your battalion commander turns up and says, yeah, by the way, gents, um, orders for tomorrow are, see that massive mountain in front of you? Well, the enemy's at the top of it. We're going up it. Um, and this was really pushed home to me recently, having walked these battlefields. And you do it in modern kits with the benefit of, you know, 30 odd years of um, nutrition and, and modern medicine and all the rest of it to make yourself a sprightly 30 odd year old bod. And yet it's still a grueling task to get up to the top of um, these uh these places and they had to do that whilst under fire whilst carrying all of their kit whilst hungry whilst sleep deprived and the more you start to put yourself in the mindset of these people i think the more respect you have for them at whatever rank they might be and for me uh, in some respects what the the rank and file go through is more remarkable than than anything else um because they just have to blindly trust and follow those orders and so for me a lot of my work has been about unpicking those stories and working out what is it about mindset that motivates soldiers how do they kind of deal with the world around them uh, what are their coping mechanisms how do they interact with their officers and, and so on and so forth um, and then I guess that kind of feeds through into um, the work that myself and, and Marcus do as uh, chair and trustee, respectively, of the Napoleon Can Revolutionary War Graves charity, which is all about sort of trying to give people more insight into 
this period and the experiences of these people by saying, look, did you know that in the church down the road from you is buried person X? Um, and, you know, kind of turning those local sites into places of memory where people can go and kind of connect with that history. Yeah, fantastic. The, I mean, we're talking about people, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that experience that grueling experience. So, you know, um, like, a bit unrelated, but still I can imagine that. Um, my last podcast episode was on Charles de Gaulle. He fought First World War. He was two meters tall. Imagine him in a trench. <laughs> you know, that's the image I had. The poor guy. I was having to duck, you know, all the time because he was so big. Um, and that's the reason why when he was captured in 1916, even though he, he escaped seven times, he was always caught because, you know, you have that two meters tall French guy in the um, German countryside trying to go back to France. Of course he failed. <laughs> Marcus, you have something to add? Thank you. Yeah, just touching on something Zach uh, rightly brought up is something about the guys carrying the kit is over history, there's often been a case of um, soldiers carrying a lot of weight. And then you find things that are innovative that come along and reduce that weight. And then you suddenly realise that, well, soldiers aren't carrying much, so we can give them something else, whether that's body armour and it's come full circle to, to knights carrying weight. And one of the, one of the myths was uh, kind of mentioning earlier is people seem to think of the Napoleonic era, people striding into battle and pushing forwards. But because there wasn't actually enough of a logistics chain, there was a logistics chain, uh, they'd often fought with their packs on. And interestingly, the weight that they carried then is very similar to Western armies carrying kit today. Arguably, we're meant to ditch our kit actually during the fighting and progressively stages moving forwards. Um, but actually, the weight was really similar when you think that actually you've got to carry spare clothes and food and plus your, you know, your personal items as well. Actually, the weight hasn't changed that much over 200 years and certainly hasn't actually changed that much between the world wars in between it's just progressively as as you save weight one area some general comes along and gives you more kit in another area going oh it's great you're looking really sprightly have this uh, and it kind of is a bit of a cycle and i've seen some very good work at things like the national army museum where they track the weight over time over 200 actually 300 years and it's really very similar the, the thing we have today that they didn't have then was better rations really yeah, nice. Um, if I can add my own little perspective, um, being a French guy, what interests me is more the transformations that were implemented in France during the era, especially during the consulate. Uh, I find that period very structuring for France, especially given the previous 10 years that have been everything but structuring, structuring you know, <laughs> um, ask the king how structural he felt. <laughs> he felt. Um, you know, after complete utter chaos mostly in the biggest country in western europe you know uh, in population in uh, you could say in, power, in raw power like how much a country can project its force in europe and you have this all this crumbling down and you then you have that few years period between 1799 and 1805 1806 you know to consolidate in the early empire where a lot of is done to improve the country's infrastructure, improve the country's institutions. And this lasts to its day. Of course, the obvious example is the, the code, the civil code, which some people call the Napoleonic code, even if I find this a bit, you know, of a shortcut. Um, but the code is still the basis of the French uh, civil law. Uh, and, but you also have, of course, the educational system, you know, with the lycée. Uh, you have the... Uh, the Prud'homme, the Conseil des Prud'hommes, which is a civil court where you can go, the Cour des Comptes, which is basically the um, the way the French finances are handled, the Légion d'honneur and all that stuff, you know. So it adds up to create the modern French state, uh, which, of course, as you know, we had many republics, empires, monarchies in, in between, but all of those stayed, uh, all of those institutions stayed during all those major changes. Uh, which I find quite remarkable and something that is very enduring, uh, thanks to Napoleon, but also thanks to the men around him. Uh, like for to come back to the Code Civil, 
Napoleon did not write it, you know, but he was the he was the man that was a head of state at the moment of its implementation. He certainly pushed for it, and he is known to be very proud of that. Um, that he, he wanted this to survive him, and it did. And I think it's a good example that all the bad stuff, the Peninsular War being the keen example that happened under Napoleon's reign, he should be blamed for that because the buck stops with him. But the good things too, should he should have some credit for it. I think we have to be fair, um, and uh, I think people should always have both perspectives. Um, Philip, you want to add something? Yeah, it's very ambiguous. No? Um... 1792, and after it, uh, uh, 1794, we had four new German-speaking departments beyond the Rhine. Montoner, Barin, de la Salle, de la Reur. Uh, it, it included uh, Cologne and, and Düsseldorf, de la Reur is the last one. Yeah? So, in all these parts of Germany, it, the Code Civil was also introduced and it became the new law there. And all this anti-French uh, things, what happened in the 19th century, it, all for this, it existed until 1900. Uh, and then it was replaced by the Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch, the, the a German version of the Kursivir. But it existed. The, the positive view of, of Napoleon existed also in Germany, but mostly beyond the Rhine. Uh, we, we still have words in French out of that time. Uh, for example, uh, me as a soldier, when I, when I was at the, at the army, we learned that um, when, when we go to the tents at night, uh, we go to Bivak. And it it I needed twenty years to understand that is still from the Napoleonic era. Yeah. Uh, that that we, that we have this words and we still we have words like Philip, we, we still say into your bivy bag, which is a bivouac as well. As it, it becomes so much, it's become slang really? within Britain. Interesting, yeah. And and we have uh, uh, words like balcon, trottoir, le garage. Uh, it's, it, we say garage or balcon and, and terrace. It, it's all there, and it's the time from the French. So uh, I I like the the quote of um, the Jewish German poet Heinrich Heine, who said about Napoleon Bonaparte, he's not cut out of the wood. Um, out of the wood that uh, out of which generals were made, he is out of the marble out of which gods were made. Yeah? So for for the Jewish population in, in in Western Germany, it was very important for the emancipation. And uh, this the 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 the, the um, innovations of Napoleon led to the innovations. Prussia made for for the Jewish population because the, Jew, the Jewish population was absolutely uh, had had much less rights than the rest of the population. So it was very important for that, um, and and very important to form a new state after it. And I I think Germany has so much from that time out of the Napoleonic uh, period, which is unknown in Germany. Yeah, that's very interesting. And question to the two Brits that we have here today. These positive effects of the whole era, how would you say they're known in the UK? Do you want to go first, Sam? Very gallant of you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, a particularly tricky question. Uh, I think if you say Napoleon's name, the first people, first thing people will think of is Napoleon Complex far before you think of, of any kind of lasting achievements, there is that sort of immediate perception of Napoleon, well, he was a dictator, dictators equal bad, because we've got that legacy of 20th century dictators, uh, which obviously doesn't hold water, you know. Equating Napoleon to Hitler is, is just historically illiterate, quite frankly. Um, I think 
th- there is always that inclination to um, emphasize the negatives because particularly if you are somebody who's steeped in your own national mythology, there's an assumption that Britain are the inverted commas good guys during this period. And people, please, if you think that, you need to pick up a history book because the British give as good as they get during this period. Uh, um, ask the deans. <laughs> precisely. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the unhelpful thing. In some respects, I think the Peninsula War kind of helps lend itself to that sort of comfy complacency because Britain, you, you can put together the narrative, well, Britain only goes to Spain and Portugal in order to help their, their allies and their friends in need. And okay, Spain was formerly an enemy, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And in, rea- in reality, if you look at it, it's, it's a marriage of convenience. Britain doesn't lift a finger when the French invade Portugal because the French invade Portugal in 1807. It's not until 1808 when the Spanish rise up, that actually Britain then starts sending troops. Um, so, yeah, I think you might find the odd person who knows about Napoleon's reforms and the code, but those folks, if you're walking down the street, those folks are going to be few and far between. So it's interesting. I actually found the Great British Public actually quite the opposite sometimes. So people realise that, you know, he was our enemy, but actually don't really know the kind of the depths. This is a broad stroke, great British public stepping off the streets and having a discussion. And they're not quite sure sometimes why we'd be fighting Napoleon at all. They've heard about the, maybe the Napoleonic Code, they've heard about Waterloo, and they've, they know he has lots of eagles, and that seems to be a really good thing. Uh, so why would, why would Wellington be fighting him? And the the national psyche, kind of like us good, him enemy, but why, how did we get down that path is not very broad in Britain, sadly. And hopefully, you know, people will be listening to this podcast will be saying, well, that's absolute rubbish because they are interested in history. So they will be coming at this from quite a, a well-researched background. Um, but yeah, I think people don't know enough about let's say, the dark side of Napoleon as well. Uh, We're not very good, as Zach rightly mentioned, at talking about our own dark side. Um, When Zach and I did podcasts about the, uh, the, let's say, the three sieges, but the four great sieges of the Peninsula War, we we deeply covered three. Um, The British go on an absolute sacking, like looting, murdering spree. And we do not like to talk about that in Britain. We don't like to talk about our defeats as well. There's very little written about like, in the Peninsula War about the Burgos campaign because we didn't do very well. Uh, we, royal we, uh, none of us were there. Uh, but they, you know, it's not something that's nationally talked about. We like to talk about the great victories and then Waterloo is fantastic. And then, you know, people like Philip and myself have great discussions about Britain, Prussia, Allied, singular. It's it's a fantastic topic. And sometimes we get kind of called out for saying, oh, well, you want to rewrite history because you're saying it's not a British victory, it's an Allied victory. Correct. It's an Allied victory. It, it was always an Allied victory. And actually, the rewriting of history was much later on uh, when we tried to kind of bring it into British psyche and try to side um, push the side, kind of step the, the Prussians there and their contribution and not talking about Nassau and, and nations like that. So Britain, we're very good at kind of putting the blinkers on, waving the flags, playing Land of Hope and Glory in Royal Britannia. And, uh, you know, who doesn't like last night the proms and having a gin and tonic and waving a flag? I know I do. Uh, but we kind of overly egg that element too much to, an el- to it by saying earlier about myths, that it can be a little bit unhelpful. Uh, and it's certainly you end up the first stages of having these discussions, actually unpicking and kind of going back to a base level uh, sometimes, which in itself is really interesting. And how did we get there? And why did we get there? Yeah, it, it can be quite interesting. The If you've only heard one thing about somebody, what have you heard about Napoleon? Well, he was short. Great. OK, well, he was about average height, actually. So let's let's start there and go on. Uh, so it, the, the Britain, we, we like a good victory. We like a successful general uh, or admiral and uh, everything else. Really, the details don't matter to us sometimes. We are guilty of, myself included. 
in, in that regard, you're no different from no different from the French, really, uh, except they're on the other side. And French and Eng- the French and English are very interesting for that argument because they've been at it for 800 years, roughly. <laughs> um, so it's nice to have, you know, um, this two perspectives. They're basically doing the same thing on each side of the channel, which is taking what they see good and put it in the national narrative and building with this. Um, I recall when I was a teenager, I recall one person, one French guy who didn't like Napoleon and called him a dictator. It was the only one I've ever heard in France saying something bad, you could say, about Napoleon. If, to everybody else, he's a hero. Da, da, da. And when you read, like, just read the history books for the kids in school, that's what you will see. You know, what was done by Napoleon. Uh, yeah, he went to Russia, should not have done that. Okay, bad. Um, that's about it. You know, it's mostly positive. Uh, it's not gray at all. It's black and white, you know. But it's the, we have the same problem in every single country, I think. Uh, if I go to England today and with my French accent, I say something bad about Admiral Nelson, I'm sure I'm not going to be well received. <laughs> if I go to the US and I, see, I do the same with George Washington, I'm not going to have a good reception either. Uh, even though those men had great qualities, but also deep flaws. <laughs> um, oh, go on, let's Zach. talk about the flaws of Nelson. <laughs> yeah, Zach? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, and I'm interested what my, my fellow podcasters um, kind of see on this. But when I look at the, the stats for the show, it's very striking how small the audience is for my show in France. You know, I've got more listeners in Denmark than I have. Uh, in France. And uh, part of that will, of course, be algorithms. You know, your, your country of origin is always going to be your biggest, then it's going to be based on language and so on and so forth. But I do wonder if there's an element of sort of French people thinking, well, I really don't want to be told about my own national history by a guy who's on the other side of the channel. I don't know if you folks sort of see equivalents, whether there are, you, you sort of end up taking a hit in, in those areas. Well, I do get most of my listeners in the U.S., but by by design, you know, I try to talk about French history from a French perspective to Americans. Um, so, of course, there is a bias, but I do get a fair amount of French listeners, sometimes French commenters, but they tend to be, especially on social media, they, they tend to be very tough in the sense that, you know, I've had a couple of French guys that see... Napoleon was a god, basically, and it gets stirring very fast. You know, they still say "Vive l'Empereur," like, come on, guys. You know, <laughs> two hundred years later, you're still going "Vive l'Empereur." Uh, you know, it can be a bit stirring and idiotic, really. And as I said, you know, historically illiterate. Um, but you know, it, I think. I mean, I don't know for the not the ideas, but the facts that you're presenting, or if it's just more the English language, because people in France tend to just not be that great with English, to be honest. Uh, those that go abroad, you know, like me here in Canada, what have you, but in France, having somebody listen to a podcast in English, whatever the subject, you just cut yourself 90% of the population right there. Yeah, that's what I see too. Um, most of my audience is US and, and Britain. Um, uh, mo- uh, the rest is in Europe. I think it's only 2% is French. So yeah, I think you're you're all right there. Um, I'd like to personally thank Napoleon for the Louisiana Purchase, especially the city of New Orleans. Done some of my best eating and drinking in that city, so thank you, Napoleon, for that. Um, well, I guess you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, in, in America, I mean, you know, he is. When I used to teach the course, um, whenever we talk about French Revolution and the aftermath, I would just I would put a silhouette of Napoleon up on the overhead for my students. And even the 10th graders who didn't know anything about Napoleon would be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. He's a French general and he won a lot of battles. And that was before I taught him anything. So his aura is out there. You know, the Napoleonic Code, of course, is important. Um, but yeah, just um, really intriguing guy here in the United States. Yeah, for sure he is a um, magnet in some sense. You know, the, the persona is so big and it's been played by himself, you know, he wanted to control the narrative from day one since he was a small general. That's clearly part of his character. I think he understood public relations better than most people of that time. And it has a huge impact on how we see him even today. 
And as for the short thing, I think English propaganda was too efficient <laughs> during that era to you know to make him look bad, and it still bears fruits today. I mean, you you had good newspapers <laughs> and good artists and good uh, uh, caricaturists, I guess, at the time, and they, they did too much of a good job. What can I tell you? Um, but Napoleon did the same thing for himself. You know, he has the same kind of perspective on himself as Churchill has. You know, I, history would be kind to me as I intend to write it. It's pretty much the same vibe in, in the sense. And of course, everything that f uh, followed him helped that because, you know, he was followed by pretty incompetent French monarchs, uh, which helps put him in a good light. You know, look at those two idiots we got about after we got Napoleon, you know. Uh, and we have... Um, quick count, about five or six regime sh change in the 19th century in France. So it does make him look good in the sense that, you know, from our perspective, he did bring some stability, at least at the beginning. And then all those darn Europeans came on us to defeat us and they destroyed everything he built. You know, it's not true, of course, but it, it's part of that narrative. It's part of that story that we have in France. And then you go to France, and the first thing you see in Paris is the Arc de Triomphe right in the middle, you know. Uh, and you have the tomb of Napoleon, and I don't know how many streets named after him or his generals, his marshals. Um, and as we said with Philippe E uh, before, there is a good reason for that, but there is no, there is no gray area when you're building a national story, and it it shows with Napoleon more, I think, than any other figure in modern European history. Even Louis XIV is outshined by... I mean, Louis XIV is outshined uh, by uh, by Napoleon's figure. Um, Philippe? Ah, yes, thank you. This is something I do not understand. On on the one hand, we have this, this, this glorious unification of France. France never was bigger than in the Napoleonic age, but the suffer of the people, of the French people, it is so evident. 200,000 French soldiers perished in Russia over the Berezina. They were annihilated. Uh, the, 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 it, it was Dutch. But the Dutch pioneers, eight came out of the Berezina and the rest froze to death. And then the young conscripts, and this was a very, very exciting conversation I had with the, with, with the French um with a French historian and he was absolutely um he had the absolute opinion that he said oh at the battle of Lutzen it was such a great effort of the um of the young guard and 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 the young conscripts they resisted such a long time against the Prussian Russian onslaught there yeah? but this victory, this French victory, were just he put in the cannon fodder in, into the meat grinder. He stuffed them in the meat grinder until the real soldiers were there. Yeah? And, and uh, th the lines there, they, they were cut through by cannonballs and the heavy carriages went through the streets and all the wounded and the knocking and the breaking of the bones were had there. And they say, this was a great victory for France. Yeah? But it was a murder of young people. So the, the Allied did the same. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to, want, to, want to say it in the, in the positive light. But all these victories we have are made by a sacrifice of the own people. And, 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 and I do not understand this positive way to speak about that. Yeah, it's... Uh, as you know, it goes back to what Zach said at the beginning of the episode, that the soldier's experience, the average guy's experience, is forgotten like this. Uh, because in the grand scheme of things, it's seen as in, unimportant. And to go back to my De Gaulle example, he had the same point of view during the First World War, even at the beginning of the Second. No sacrifice is too hard or too tough to make for France. That's the perspective of somebody that has that very romanticized view of the homeland. And it's something I've seen often in France. Like There is a, a conception of the country almost as a living thing. France is beyond 
its leaders, its men, the people that live in it. It's like an entity by itself. And there is that part of that, that, that firm belief in some people's mind. And I think Napoleon had it, even though he was born in a country that was not his a year before he was born. <laughs> As you know, Corsica became French shortly before Napoleon's birth. Um, it's very impressive to see how effective that sentiment can be. And it certainly shows in Napoleon's life story and many of his generals, I think they shared his view on that, on that aspect. Uh, he was not alone sacrificing men. And you see that oh, in some other, of course, uh, European countries. But for some reason, I think it's very strong in France, maybe because of the country's history, maybe because it was one of the first nation states as we understand it. Um, uh, I'm sure you, ha you have your share of British leaders that have the same point of view for England. Uh, it's more important than anything else. Uh, they would sacrifice even themselves if need be. Um, but it, uh, it is shocking when you think about it, that uh, carelessness about the average uh, soldier's life. Uh, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was, first off, I was just going to say, because you mentioned about um, Churchill a little just before this discussion evolved. And I think it's really interesting if you go around uh, Churchill's private home at Chartwell, there's four uh, busts of Napoleon plus French, like friendship medals that depict Napoleon, one of Nelson and one sketch of Wellington. But the Napoleon is actually there on his desk, a large bust of uh, Napoleon on his writing desk next to a small bust of, of Nelson. But picking up Philip's excellent point and yours as well, you know, it's something that I'm going to come back to in, in the next point, but the, the glory does not outweigh the suffering, in my opinion. And this is why I haven't really nailed my colours to the mask yet. This is why I'm not a fan of Napoleon. Because talking about what his the fact that he's glorious and this and it is obviously i imagine in french history one of the heights if not the highest point of the french empire is influence and certainly kind of you know the, the focal point of so many important parts of history but underneath that the suffering of the normal people the soldiers i'm reminded of uh it after the first world war um, the the scars on Allied soldiers. Now, if you go to Hyde Park Corner, there's the Machine Gun Corps Memorial, also known as the Boy David. And uh, it's there, it's almost a completely nude figure holding a sword with a machine gun either side. And the, the sculptor, uh, Francis Wood, he uh, made his name uh, crafting masks for um for wounded, uh, for wounded young men. And it came about because they weren't being allowed to be in the victory parades for the First World War. And they were shunned in the streets because they had shell fragments or missing parts, their noses, ears, eyes. And the public like kind of shunned them away, quite Phantom of the Opera-esque. So they, he made these amazing masks and prosthetics. And I'm kind of reminded then of the people who suffered, you know, during the Napoleonic Wars, cannonballs doing some of the most uh, casualties from afar. And not certainly saber marks, you know, closer up and what would have been there. But in France itself, we, everyone seems to think it, it, with a, these broad strokes like you're talking about that, um, you know, France supported Napoleon. Well, there was huge, like kind of active and passive resistance. And one of that was against conscription. Uh, it was viewed as, you know, going away for a long time and families were hiding conscripts or hiding um, their family to not be conscripted. Uh, and there's been some really good work by like Charles Lesday and Roy Muir finding these cases because they're not as well publicised uh, and trying to find them, kind of bringing them to the forefront of these cases where uh, the public were kind of hiding other people's sons as they'd escaped back, uh, certainly in 1813 and 1814, uh, because, you know, they kind of empathised with the suffering of their own young uh, sons or, um, you know, husbands going off to war for Napoleon's cause, as, as it's seen today. Yes, yeah, Zach. Yeah, I mean, it's, Marcus raises a couple of interesting points there. I mean, conscription is always unpopular, right? That's, that's just going to be a given. Nobody likes to be told you are going to war. And for all that Britain doesn't dabble in official conscription, the, the, the methods that are used to sort of encourage people into the militia are, are deeply unpopular. Um, Britain does have its own little sort of murky system um, of forcing people into the Navy that we don't like to really mention. Uh, a la La Presse Gang, 
um, which is basically we're going to kidnap you and stick you on this boat and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but yeah, it was interesting when you were saying about how Churchill didn't have much of Wellington around. I wonder to what extent that's to do with what happens next for Wellington. And you and I have spoken about this at length and how I liken Wellington's career post Waterloo to that final season of Game of Thrones, because there are moments where you put your head in your hands and go, what the hell was this guy smoking? Um, so I, I suspect that that's probably part of it, that from a conservative politician's point of view, actually, it's not Wellington that you want to remember politically, but militarily. Um, Wellington's probably are either our greatest or second greatest soldier of all time. Um, mm. there, there aren't many who can come close. Um, the sketch of Wellington is in his own bedroom, so at least that's something, and it's a very small bedroom. Uh, that's so. a very odd place to keep a sketch of Wellington. I mean, it's almost the sort of thing I could imagine you doing, Marcus. No, it's very personal, his private bedroom, because it's like down a corridor. Uh, so it, and then Clemmy, his wife, had the large grand bedroom, um, so, and where she's got loads of nice uh, China statues of French soldiers. So yeah, let's leave that one there. Yes, John? What I think is interesting is in the history of France, it seems to me that when France is in its greatest need, there tends to be a, a soldier who comes out of nowhere or a little town like Lille, uh, where De Gaulle came from, or Doremi, where uh, Joan of Arc came from, or Corsica, where Napoleon came from, to kind of come in as a commoner, rectify things, and then go away. And it seems like in those three cases, it was just the average person who came in an average soldier and elevated France to where it needed to be. So yeah, I mean, Napoleon did cause a lot of, you know, awful deaths and destruction during his time, but he also rectified a lot of things that needed to be fixed. Yeah, especially given the situation in France at the time, you know, mm. uh, we had no clue where we were going with that revolution thing. You know, uh, there is no way you can predict what happened. I mean, ask, as the Russians, <laughs> mm. uh, how a revolution can go wrong. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's something that is very impressive uh, in the sense that, as you say, he he's a low level guy from uh, any standpoint. You know, he he comes from a background um, backwater country which was not even French that, not that long before. Um, so he, he has nothing going his way. I do think that having that outside of the Political uh, era, uh, not era, the political scene actually gave him an edge at some point, you know, uh, because the classical French political scene of the time was upside down because of the revolution. Uh, so being from out of it actually maybe gave him an advantage. He didn't have the old reflexes maybe of the old French politicians that maybe played against him. I think he played for them in 1814 when he came back in force uh, with the Bourbon restoration. Uh, but during that era, uh, 1799 to uh, 1805, when he reinstalls his power in force in France, I think it helped him to have this perspective. And there's, you know... Um, he does have that young man's energy also that was utterly lacking with the old French novels of the time. Uh, I'm sure you had the same issue in Britain at the time when you would have some high-ranking novel that has nothing to do with a situation but is assigned there because it's some duke or some lord that should be assigned a situation. And in France, we had the same issue, of course, at the end of the 18th century. And when we have those guys, do, I mean, look at the marshals. Most of them don't come from that high ranking uh, standing. Uh, they are low ranking. Yep. Uh, they would have gone nowhere uh, 25 years before. Uh, mm -hmm. And with that new system, that could be seen as a kind of a positive of the revolution that allowed, you know, these people to rise to power, or at least to positions of power up to a point. It did give that unique melting pot of competent people that took. France, which was, you know, a huge country with big resources, many people, and build that empire, but as Marcus said, to the cost of hundreds of thousands of French lives. And in the end, you know, it's easy for us to judge 200 years later. Once you're caught in it, you know, you war after war after war, it's, uh, of course, they could have th done things differently, and they should have, but it's easy for us to say, uh, looking from our perspective. Zach. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the important things I think to bear in mind with Napoleon is that it's a mistake to consider him a constant. You know, the man goes through peaks and troughs like any human being does. And one of the dangers perhaps of putting any historical character on a pedestal, and I'm not a fan of doing it for anybody, um, is that if you elevate somebody to this sort of demigod-like status, you forget the fact that they are human. And sure, they make mistakes. And sometimes they really screw things up. Other times they pull out absolute blinders. And if you strip that from somebody, actually, I would suggest they become a bit more boring in the process because it's that fragility that, that makes humans such fun. Um, well, in my opinion, anyway. Um, but yeah, so the, the thing that I always say is that in 1801, maybe up until the point where we get the, the transition to the empire, Napoleon's really the guy France needs, absolutely needs, because somebody needs to step up and provide that kind of centralised control. And it's only when we get that transition to the empire um, and sort of the, the increasing sort of creep of power and influence that I would argue that things start to properly go downhill for him in terms of, um, well, all, all factors, really. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, a mistake to consider Napoleon as he is in the 1790s in Italy to be the same person who decides to, to land in the south of France in early 1815 in what then leads to Waterloo. You know, these are very different people at different points in terms of health even um, at that point. You know, bear in mind that when he lands um, in 1815, he's, he's only six years away from death you know the cancer is it's there somewhere within him quite the extent to which he's being affected by it is obviously something that we could debate endlessly and never get to the bottom of um but yeah it's it's interesting and apologies we're, we're dappling a lot in sort of the next focus that you wanted to take us down but i think it is always worth us kind of bearing in mind that napoleon's complex because he's human and because he changes, like all other humans. Yeah, it's a very good point, and one that either the fans or the haters of Napoleon should keep in mind. He was just a man, with all the good and the bad stuff that comes with it. Uh, we're going to move to the next point. And uh, but we're gonna change the order because our friend Philip has some technical issue at the moment, but he's gonna come back. So we're gonna go with uh, Marcus first. So our point is Napoleon's lasting influence. So what to you is the greatest heritage of the Napoleonic era? And since you're di from different countries, I think we're gonna have very different and interesting answers on that on that point. Even the two Brits might have different answers. <laughs> I think we will. And can I just say, culturally, I love being called Marcus again. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's, it takes me back to my school days in French lessons. Um, yeah, I would say that for me, Napoleon's biggest lasting legacy, and we've touched on it quite a lot already, is that impression and the legacy of his glory. Uh, his name, his symbology, his... Um, I think actually, Emmanuel, it was in your podcast that you said he's one of the men that you don't need to say his full name. Either name will do. Uh, if you said R.K. Bonaparte, well, he's part of a family, but we know him as Bonaparte. If you say Napoleon, you don't. You know we're not talking about Napoleon the Third. Okay, we're very rarely talking about Napoleon the Third. We're talking about Napoleon Bonaparte, and that that name is he is always going to be from from now until the end of this planet, um, he is going to be one of the most famous men. He is going to be up there with Caesar, religious leaders, Genghis Khan, it's Napoleon Bonaparte. He is going to be one of the biggest influences in history ever. And I think that's his legacy. That is incredible. Dot, dot, dot. However, I think what that does is it kind of shadows so much of the darker side that we've touched on already. 
Uh, his legacy is so impressive that we don't talk about the suffering of the normal people. His legacy is so impressive. We don't talk about his suppression of French civil rights under his dictatorship. His legacy is so impressive that we that it's frowned upon to call him a dictator, even though de facto he was. Uh, and I'm starting to show my colours more now. But he, you know, he is so well um, kind of covered with those elements. And that comes across largely, and I am impressed by this, his, his ability to do that himself, writing his own memoirs uh, on um, San Helena. You know, that's that's a great movement uh, here because actually he starts to get to control his own narrative, uh, but using incredible symbology. You know, using imperial eagles, which is really reminiscent of uh, Julius Caesar and the the height of the Roman Empire, and all of those bits that come with it, the the olive branch, uh, the Legion d'Honneur, uh, bringing back in um, the aristocracy, which is often forgotten that it'd been taken away, but he brings it kind of back in, and huge nepotism here, giving it to his some of his closest friends, his lackeys, and his really. It, it's face it, his family are not that um, impressive, but they end up with titles, prince, princesses, kingdoms uh, on themselves. And he really uses that to control the historical narrative. And, you know, the, the Bonaparte, Bonaparte family have a meteoric rise and are always going to be there in history. So his legacy, I, I'm always impressed by his legacy. Uh, and if anyone knows, you know, some of my previous podcasts, you know, that might surprise you because I am no fan of the man. And I think the bad outweighs the good. And I will I'll lay that down now. Um, you know, I do think he was a, a, a dictator. I do think that he uh, controlled France very tightly and suppressed legitimate opposition. Uh, elections really were a farce under him. And, you know, things like conscription and other elements. However, he did it in a very clever way. And that in itself is actually quite admirable. So, you know, kind of hands up. I, I see the balance here and I can see why people are always going to be impressed or just fascinated by Napoleon. You know, Waterloo is one of the most written about battles, I think, if not the most bas- uh, written about battle in history. Up there. If It's certainly up there, D-Day, Stalingrad uh, and the Somme. But he's also had the most books written about it. We have to ask ourselves why that is uh, sometimes, but his, it, it really is um, great to kind of to talk about his legacy in that manner uh, and in the so far that we can, we can talk about his legacy and what is perceived as glory. However, I think it should start to peel back and when we can start to talk about the negatives of Napoleon without being openly criticised for just daring to say that. And that's something uh, that can be quite difficult. Uh, People accuse you as being anti-French, which is definitely not the case. Uh, And I think it's really important that we can take Napoleon away from the myths. I think both Zach and John earlier, you know, quoted things about demigods. uh, And we need to be careful about that. He was a man, you know, he almost certainly died of cancer. He wasn't poisoned and removed, uh, as certainly um, some of the Bonapartists would have a say. But then that, again, is interesting that people would identify as Bonapartists today. They will go to his tomb on the anniversary of his death in Chant Vive. Uh, Or there's even political parties that, you know, talk about um, Christophe Bonaparte and call him prince in a republic. So it's a very interesting uh, state that France can find itself in. Uh, And so we will always be fascinated by it. I think I will always find the fascination with fascinating uh, of Napoleon and uh, people who have his uh, have flags of his on the wall or um, I've seen bed covers and bed sheets uh, with Napoleon's face on it or uh, Imperial Eagle uh, duvet covers. Uh, interesting. I, I, I want to know more of why they do that. It's, it is fascinating. I mean, I, think, I don't think anybody can deny the man's intelligence and cleverness. That would just be nonsensical. As for his morals, uh, that can be discussed, <laughs> clearly. As Zach said before, they, these do change over time. Uh, I don't think you can call 
Napoleon Bonaparte from 1792, the same man as Napoleon Bonaparte from 1812. You know, they're, they're almost two different beings, I think, at some point. And he's, sometimes I think he's too clever for his own good uh, and for France's good. And it shows in the whole period. So you know, that was my little comment. Please, Zach. Yeah, just to answer Marcus's point about, you know, why do these things exist? Well, it's, it's capitalism, isn't it? You know, there's a fast buck to be made out of tacky merch. You know, slap Napoleon's face on a mug and it'll probably sell. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried it, but, um, you know, there's, there's a market in that, I'm sure. But Marcus tapped into a, a more serious point and something that I find quite hilarious, which is the, the fact that basically... Napoleon acts like a 19th century autocrat. Now that, in some respects, shouldn't surprise us. You know, this is not an era of democracy. Even in Britain, for all that we love to go, oh, we're the cradle of democracy. Well, mm, no, not really. Have you looked at the rotten borough system that we have in this country? It's, Britain is not the sort of the shining example of, um, of democracy during this age. But the, these kind of, this authoritarian style of government isn't a world away from what's happening in Russia or in Austria during this period. And this is where the, the pro-Napoleon, some of the pro-Napoleon arguments start to fall apart. Because if you want to say that he's so much better than the other European rulers of this period, then you've got to be able to back that up with something. And actually, when you look at the structures of government, when you look at the, the secret police, etc., that's just not the case. If anything, the, the, the 19th century autocratic powers learn a great deal from what Fouché puts together under the Bonapartist regime. And so you, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that Napoleon was only doing what other 19th century autocrats were doing, and then also say that he was so much better than them, because then you're starting to really nitpick between quite how do you want to split these hairs? That's a very fair assessment, I would say. Marcus, and then we'll move on to Philip. Thanks. I think, actually, my biggest um, point from this, it really links to Zach, is actually it's not against Napoleon. His story is fascinating, and it really is an impressive rise. It's the people who've put Napoleon on this pedestal that, yeah, I can see Zach agree, that actually can be difficult to engage with with history. So we, it's people say, you know, he's, he's democratic. Well, that's just not true. The elections are deeply flawed. Um, and they really, you know, he, he does things like cast the vote for the army, assuming they want to vote for him. Well, that's not really how armies work, actually, especially if they're being conscripted. Um, but also it's the, it's room. It's not the fact that he kind of has bad women's rights. It's the fact he reverses women's rights that have been put in place by the French Revolution. It's not the fact that he has slavery in the French Empire. It's the fact that he reintroduces slavery, which has been banned during the French Revolution, both of which I know I'm talking with the 21st century ideals, but women's rights and anti-slavery are good policies and the, lots of countries are on their way there arguably not Russia, but lots of countries are slowly making that progress or at least having discussions, even Britain in Parliament, you know, is having those discussions about abolition of slavery. And we're kind of thinking about, and we're, and we're especially um, discussing the morality of it in Britain, uh, largely backed by uh, religious leaders, actually, quite interestingly. But it's, it's those reversal elements. And he, he didn't keep the status quo. He didn't keep those liberal revolutionary principles um, that that are there, and Napoleon's been called the French Revolutionary, uh, French Revolution continued on horseback. I, I refute that. I think actually he reverses that so much for his own gain. Now that's fine. Lots of people have done that over history. If you like that, that is okay. But hold up for what it is that he is, as Zach said, very autocratic. He is a dictator, self crowned dictator. You know, that in itself, power move taking the, uh, the crown off the Pope and putting it on his head and putting it on Josephine's head. You know, if King Charles had done that um, last month, uh, I think a few eyebrows would have been raised in Westminster. Uh, we would have thought that was a hell of a move if he did that instead. You know, we had a very traditional system. Napoleon didn't, but hold it up for what it is. Uh, I think own his dictatorship and that makes him a strong man. 
but don't say that he's you know kind of democratic when he's autocratic yeah yeah that's also very fair and i i did mention that element of napoleon in my in my episodes on him that he would take from the ancien regime what he needed and he would take from the new republic what he needed and with those elements that old aristocracy those elements of monarchy and that new form of government that was the french republic and that these new young men rising up he took all of this and the men around him took all of this and they built that empire but he certainly was no uh, ideologue uh, you know pro democracy man that would be nonsensical to say now on to uh, philip who just came back yes um what stays huh? I already said a lot about uh, about Napoleon Bonaparte and uh, what is the heritage of it. I think the main heritage for Germany is that Germany wouldn't exist without Napoleon Bonaparte. We wouldn't have a Germany. We never would be a state. We never, never uh, had uh, our anthem. Uh, the anthem was composed in the time under the resistance in, in the in the uprising of. Uh, of Prussia, and our colors wouldn't wouldn't exist without the, uh, the Napoleonic heritage, without Na Napoleon Bonaparte. So uh, we must think that he exists, but also see in it what danger it can be if you have some a person like that. But we didn't learn out of that. We had. Uh, an autocrat. We have the autocrat of 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 the twentieth century. Yeah, we we didn't learn out out of the past what can happen if if you ha have so much power in one person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good connection. You know, the right. I mean, the creation of the German state as a consequence of the Napoleonic era. That's a big one. That's one's part of what I wanted to say is also, but it's definitely a big one, that's for sure, for the uh, German national narrative. Um, John? Yeah, I could have gone a couple of routes for this. I first thought about the Napoleonic Code, which is a, a very good legacy. Um, a very bad legacy, I would say, is the first real version of fake news were his bulletins. Uh, they were kind of uh, I mean, they're semi-accurate, but not usually. They're usually just pomp and circumstance celebrating his victories. But I would say the main legacy was his uh, military upgrades. Um, before Napoleon, they had campaign seasons, which you could only campaign in spring and, and summer. You couldn't campaign during the wet months or the cold months. You had gentlemanly maneuvering, where you had nobles you know, maneuvering each other out of position, and that would be the battle, and then they would go home. You know, Napoleon kind of revolutionized all of that. You know, the core system, although he didn't come up with it, he really utilized it to the best of its ability. We still use core systems today to divide our armies up. Uh, the idea of small, self-sufficient units with high amounts of firepower. Like, well, why does that matter today? Well, what do most of our special forces units use today? They're small, independent units with high amounts of firepower that can be supported by nearby units. Um, And then, as I mentioned earlier, logistics. I was talking about Marshal Berthier earlier, and Marcus put up a note that said logistics win wars, and that's true. And I think he revolutionized it. Um, I think, uh, you know, Jomini and um, uh, so many others who kind of studied the science of war, Clausewitz, um, really learned that logistics is an important part, maybe the most important part of battling and fighting because you got to have bullets, you got to have food, you got to have uh, beds for your troops, you got to have hospital care. So I think those reasons are what made Napoleon really unique and really stand out. And really his downfall came when his enemies started copying his systems and started implementing the core system on their own right. So that I think is his main legacy, at least on the military side. Thank you. you know, agreed. <laughs> um, on to Zach. Yeah, a lot of my points have kind of been covered already, so I don't want to um, hog the mic any longer than, than necessary. We, we've touched on the code, the way in which it embeds that kind of inherent misogyny, not just within France, but then also because it's quite good in a number of respects in terms of 
that kind of centralized legal system, when you take that and start to replicate it or use it as a basis, then you start to see that kind of cross-pollination of those ideas into other um, into other cultures, not to say that you know misogyny is, is unique to Napoleonic France. Of course, it's not. Um, that's a thing that goes back millennia. Um, but you know, you, you take the good with the bad, right? Um, Marcus put it very well. You know, he spins his own story, and he spun one of the greatest stories in history. No question, it's a potent mix of what you can achieve if you're utterly Machiavellian in your outlook and combine that with considerable talent and huge amounts of energy and remarkable intellect um for me the greatest irony of course is that it shouldn't have ended the way it did right he'd done most of the hard work um by you know 1805 six, seven, um certainly and then through spain and a refusal to compromise when it comes to those peace proposals in 1813 14 um the the whole thing implodes and you know the map of Europe would have been totally different. The course of European history would have been completely different. Um, I mean, there's one thing that Marcus touched on, I think, that I just want to go back to, which is the whole slavery thing, the 21st century mindset. And I don't have a problem with looking at history with a 21st century mindset. We are going to look back on the past from our position and our current values are always going to be what influences our outlook. That's what historians have done since historians were historians, we've always looked back for the clues of what kind of led to the present. And so we're always going to have that kind of impetus. Um, slavery is obviously a very easy club to bash Napoleon with. And Britain needs to be really careful because we do have that cosy complacency um, that, oh, well, you know, we abolish the slave trade and, and then we go and force other nations to abolish the slave trade. And so aren't we wonderful? And the reality is that we're behind the, the French Republic in that regard initially until napoleon reverses everything you know we don't abolish the slave trade until 1807 we leave slavery in place until the 1830s but none of this is about sort of being woke because there's nothing wrong with saying actually you know what that was not okay what we did back then and that needs acknowledging and just because something was the norm back then doesn't mean that we just sort of go oh well ain't that a shame never mind let's just forget about that you know and i, I think that's an important point to emphasize that does love to kind of get forgotten about or because people want to get sort of very shouty about these things and start hurling insults that sort of it's not a subtle opinion by any stretch of the imagination but that balanced opinion does just kind of get thrown to the sidelines yeah i think that's very uh, very accurate way of putting it you know i mean in the slavery example it's perfect i mean enslaving somebody is wrong whatever the time period and uh, it should be said and it should be hammered in people's mind you know and and there is no in my opinion there is no point in saying who was first to abolish it everybody should have done it and that's it <laughs> uh, there is no price trophy here and so just to finish that uh, the, the whole point my own perspective on napoleon's legacy is a bit bigger than the man i would say is the propagation of the revolutionary ideals of the french revolution in europe because of the wars it was not the goal. The goal was not to bring the revolution abroad, but it did. The thing is, those seeds were planted by bayonets, not by books, not by speech. Like, the German example is perfect for that. We went there and we basically crushed everybody. But the Germans also learned about what was going on in France and the ideas and everything that came with it. And of course, they were, uh, the Germans were always sensible to it because of the, uh, you know, the Lumière in France, the Enlightenment. The Germans had their own enlightenment, uh, especially in Prussia. So that all contributed to the major political changes in Europe in the mid-19th century, especially the revolutions of 1848, which I find are very understudied uh, <laughs> compared to the 1789 and the revolution and the uh, Napoleonic era. But those changes, including France, but outside of France, you know, Talking about Germany, 1848 is a major date. Uh, if you go to Switzerland, if you go to many countries, it is a pivotal moment. And all this comes from the Napoleonic era. You have those seeds planted there in the eight, 1805 or six up until 1815. And a generation later, or a generation and a half, you have all those major changes. And I think it comes from that. It comes from the Code Civil. It comes from the Enlightenment and everything that went 
not only from France, but through France, because France did not invent all those things, of course, but it was kind of a canal through which it went in Europe, through force of arms. And I recall that there was a TV series made about Napoleon maybe 15 years ago with the French actor Christian Clavier. I don't know if you've watched it. And at some point, he's talking with Josephine after their divorce. And he says something that Point Napoleon would not have said, but I think the point stands. He's talking to her and says, basically, I don't understand why they could not see the beauty of what I was bringing them. And she said, well, maybe the gift was nice, but they didn't like the packaging. And I think it's a good way of putting it. You know, even if the idea is not so bad, if you bring it with a cannonball, it's not the best way to do it. Ask Marshall Lan about that. Anyhow, we're going to go to the next point, which is Ukraine. A Ukraine, for those who don't know, is a hunk of revisited history. Like we create our own version of historical facts. Victor Hugo would have loved that one, you know. <laughs> Waterloo, Waterloo, Morne Plaine. In the event of a Napoleonic victory at Waterloo, what do you think would have ensued? Would Napoleon have been able to hold power in France? Would the Seventh Coalition collapse? Or would they, would they have regrouped and quickly crushed the emperor? So let's start with Philip. Yeah, I start here. So um, any party of the coalition was about to deploy 150,000 troops. After, uh, until November, 16 states joined the coalition and deployed was ready to deploy 400,000 more troops. So the coalition had a, would have at this point 1 million troops. So I would claim that there was not any chance for Napoleon to stay in power at that point. And this was only one impact. So all the, if you say, okay, we produce revolutions in the West. The Serbian states fall back to Napoleon Bonaparte. This would never have happened because all the Western states under Napoleonic rule were absolutely burnt out. So no impact to have a Saxony back. No impact to have a Württemberg back in the, in, in the French space. So it would be absolutely nothing. It was lucky. It was absolutely lucky for France that Napoleon was crushed at this point. Go ahead, Marcus. Uh, I'm not going to rock the boat too much from Philip, I think, here. I strongly agree. Um, John and I were debating it very recently on his excellent podcast, which I think uh, is coming out in June. And uh, we were talking about the, the kind of the what if uh, might have happened. And um, what I think is we've got Russia uh, have, have reached as far as uh, the Rhine, roughly. You've got Austria mobilizing against the French Southern uh, Army at the time, which is massively under strength in comparison. Uh, Britain is bringing over reinforcements from the end of the War of 1812, over from New Orleans, effectively, and also um, Canada which is going to be tiny in comparison. Uh, but we know that, you know, we like the narrative of the plucky Brits and Wellington himself says he relies upon that article there and he puts great faith in the, in the British soldier. Uh, we've got uh, Prussian uh, reserves coming up and even as far as Sweden's mobilising, Portugal's mobilising. Uh, I think that it is inevitable the outcome that if it carries on, you know, we think of the victory parade after Waterloo, there's a huge Russian presence and Cossacks kind of camping in the streets of Paris. Um, the Russian kind of army has huge numbers and then other armies have certainly got, you know, their own uh, qualities coming in. I think actually the writing's on the wall. For me, actually, it's not what would have happened after Waterloo. It would have been an allied victory either way, whether that was a week later, a fortnight or a month. It's what Napoleon was trying to achieve by returning in 1815. For me, it seems to come down to glory. Or I will pose a subsequent question, uh, and actually be quite interested what Zach thinks on this one. Do you think, and I, because I do, do you think he was trying to die in battle? And I think that's maybe what Napoleon was trying to achieve there. 
I think it would certainly fit his own idea of himself. That's for sure. Mm. When you think of the poisoning that he tried to do when, before he went to Elba, uh, his actions on leading forward the Imperial Guard, uh, and certainly his mental state when he was so unwell, poss- I, I, that's, I think there's some possible um, evidence of that. Well, I think in the case of the poisoning, there is a clear element of depression here, just you know, clinical depression in the man that would have been diagnosed today mm, as, yeah. as, as is. Um, as for Waterloo, um, I think you're right that he would have been happy of dying of a loose cannonball that just struck him on the field and, and his, it would have been very fitting. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly better than being sent to rot on Saint Helena, mm-hmm. that, that's for sure. C- can you imagine the Napoleonic kind of narrative then if he died by a cannonball on, on Waterloo? The, gi- the gift shop's bad enough now. Um, there's, a, there's a little tiny like book in French about Wellington, and I think there's nothing when I last visited about Blücher. Uh, certainly nothing about the Prince of Orange. Uh, there's, there's a postcard. Uh, there's a nice cushion. If, if you're a fan of, of Bluetooth-themed upholstery, then, you know, your quid's in. But, yeah, it's, a it's, 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 it's take your pick of whether you want a gilt stitch statue of Napoleon or a marble one or a alabaster one. It, you honestly, can get a squidgy head one. You can get him in a snow globe. If he died there, it would have been a shrine. In the, and I think that would have suited his mental state, as sad as that is. You know, a man, a man wants to take his life is, is nothing. I'm certainly not celebrating. Um, but I think that he, he was in that mental state that actually he has this last chance of glory. He knows really it's his last battle. Uh, and what a way to go. He doesn't want to, as you say, you know, rot in another prison. And it, it, it would make sense. But I would say... From maybe because of my French perspective, the fact that he went to rot on Saint Helena actually serves his narrative, because sending him over there shows that people were scared of him, that the other powers were scared completely of him. Because kill him, right? You know, if he's such a danger, just kill the guy. You just defeated him. You have control of him. Why don't you make some some phony trial and then just hang him or shoot him? Like, you know, the French that were their own, you know, Marshal Ney and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what we did. And the fact that they exiled him like this, just for me, Frenchmen, especially for people that love the character of Napoleon, is a proof that, well, they had respect for him. And I'm sure I, well, Wellington certainly did. That is well known. Uh, but I think the, the fact that they exiled him helped him. Well, he wrote his memoir during this time and it served the narrative that they were so f- afraid of him that they would just send him away, like just just go away, because they knew that if they killed him, they, you make him a martyr. Even if even if he's wrong, even if he's a dictator, even if, even if all of this is perfectly true and you can prove it, if you kill the guy, you make him a martyr, and you know that can be very dangerous. And I think the British were very happy that he did not die on that battlefield. Yeah, I think if we united, that would have united. You know, France was fractured. They were they were Bourbons, they were Bonapartists, they were people who were just tired of the war. You know, they'd been born into war and had only known war. If you killed him, you know, that would have made yeah, it would have made him a martyr. United France. It's just a shame that you know actually it was Britain, and it's not because I'm saying this because I'm British, but it's a shame that Britain didn't win in the negotiations and send him to Saint Helena or the other alternative was the Falkland Islands in the in the first time, and then we wouldn't have had Waterloo. And arguably, who suffered the most from Waterloo? was France, you know. So you know, that, I think that's quite quite sad in many ways. Yeah. Zach, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just sort of chiming in with what you said and then also in response to Marcus's specific question. It, sure, it absolutely suits his his ends to go to St Helena. Um, partly because you know he's literally Prometheus on a rock. Um, that image is absolutely something that he knows people are going to tap into. And, and then it gives him that opportunity, doesn't it, to spin his own narrative. He starts to dictate his experiences. He lashes out at pretty much anybody who he can possibly find to blame for various failings. If only X had done Y, then it would all be different. Um, and, you know, this goes back to what John's saying, that actually, no, that's not necessarily fair because it's actually these guys who help him win in his times of success. And he's quite happy to, to roll with it in the good times. But, you know, you, you can't bite the hand that feeds all the time. Um, to go back to Marcus's point about is, is Napoleon trying to die at Waterloo? Um, 
And there's been some really interesting work done on this recently by a good friend of mine, Ed Koss, who wrote all for the King Shilling. So he's, which is all about kind of mindset of soldiers during this period. So he's kind of looked at Napoleon's mental state from a couple of um, avenues. There's very strong evidence of narcissism, which will surprise precisely nobody. Um, but interestingly, Napoleon even writes a treatise on suicide at one point in his life. Um, the guy's thinking about this a lot at different points along the way. Um, does he come back to die at Waterloo? Well, no. I, I think we can all be pretty sceptical of the idea that the Waterloo campaign is just an effort to die in battle. But he does have a history of these kinds of gestures. Think about, I think it's 1814, isn't it, when he moves his horse over a shell and it explodes and it kills the horse and miraculously he survives. I think he's... He's always going to have an eye on history. He, he literally built his reputation, his empire, with one eye on history. And sure, if he dies in action, when all of the odds seem to be stacked against him, that, it's easy for us to say this with hindsight, but that kind of suits the long-term goal, doesn't it? Um, so I don't think Napoleon's scared of death in battle, by any stretch of the imagination. And I think, in some respects, it sort of solves a... A fear for him, which is what happens if he does lose. Onto John now. Yeah, I agree with the guys for the most part. Uh, Philip had a great point. I don't think Waterloo would have made any difference. Uh, that, you know, he had what two hundred thousand men against one million, and more coming against Napoleon. Basically, it was all of Europe versus Napoleon. I will say that the comments I get most whenever I talk about Waterloo is, "What if Davout was there? What if Murat was there?" Again, maybe, maybe they would have won. I don't know. I, I, I think it's just the blame game on Grouchy and Ney is ridiculous. And I have, I have a real problem with that. Napoleon was the overall commander there. Um, but, you know, was he trying to die there? I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think so, but I'm a big fan of Napoleon. I think he was legitimately trying to get one more victory, get a peace accord from the seventh coalition and maybe keep his throne. Um, I do feel happy for him that he got another 100 days back in Paris. That was probably way nicer than Elba. But uh, the consolation prize was St. Helena, which wasn't very nice. And, you know, I, I think it was just an interesting time, but I don't think – I think he maybe had a 1 in 10 chance of keeping his throne. And he was up against stiff odds before in Italy and in other areas and had come out victorious. But this one, I don't think there was almost any way he would have been uh, victorious. Philip? I want to get focus on uh, the thing that he built his own legend. And this is the thing he did for a long time. And in the same place, I want, want to see that he, he did something like scapegoating. Any battle he lost, he found a scapegoat for, for himself, except himself. The, the battle for, for Leipzig, for example. There should be found one person who uh, that that uh, who didn't uh, who was re responsible for the bridges for the retreat bridges, but everyone knew that Napoleon Bonaparte did all by himself. All things, all all small stones were were made by himself. But but then the bridge, there was no bridge, and the only bridge which existed was blown up after he crossed. Battle of Leipzig also. And this was, was one of the, the, the great evident mistakes of Napoleon Bonaparte. He claimed that the Saxon troops who changed the sides were a big size, that they were decisive for the loss of Leipzig. And he claimed there were 60 guns which changed sides, turn around and shoot in the own French lines. And this treason was responsible for the loss of Leipzig. And this major point led the movement, the, the national movement of Germany, introduced the national movement of Germany. So his lie led to this. And this, this, this form of scapegoating is something which I think is evident 
to value Napoleon Bonaparte. Yeah, agreed. If we can all agree on his intelligence, we can also agree on his ego, <laughs> which was fairly big. <laughs> on to Zach for the last word. Yeah, the others have covered the, the bulk of it. You know, nothing changes, literally nothing. Um, the Russians are coming, right? That's, that's your big one. Um, and nothing has fundamentally changed from 1814. Um, one perhaps slightly different tack to think on this one is what happens on the 19th of um, June. If, if Napoleon beats Wellington's um, Anglo-Dutch slash German army, um, that's not including the Prussians because the Prussians are a separate army. I'm not conflating the two and saying that Wellington commanded the Prussian forces for people who love to go what about. Um, but what if Mont Saint Jean goes the other way? Well, you've got to ask yourself: Does a catastrophic rout look imminent amongst Wellington's forces? Not really. They've been hard pushed, but there's nothing to suggest a complete shattering amongst the forces. You've then got Blucher literally on his doorstep. Um, so the next day, the French have to fight. There, there really isn't an alternative, and you've got a sort of inversion of what. Napoleon's been trying to do since Ligny, i.e. hold one army at arm's length and then go after the other. And you're doing this in a situation where the men have been campaigning. They've fought four battles already in the space of four days. The supply lines, sure, it's, it's not as though they're, they're long, but these men are, are running short of food. They're running short of ammunition. Where do, how many times can you keep asking before fundamentally you break your own force. Um, so maybe we end up with another battle to talk about, and it's Blücher who does the decisive uh, act in terms of breaking Napoleon's force, and then perhaps that has a knock-on impact in terms of Prussia's clout when it comes to the negotiations for the Congress of Vienna, as opposed to Britain being able to go, look, it was our guy who was in charge at Mont Saint-Jean, so therefore it's all about us, which is basically the British tactic pretty much all the time through history is to overemphasize our own role in things but yeah fundamentally nothing changes yeah and i completely agree and i think the strongest evidence of that is i mean not evidence but some case to me to make for it is that france is just completely destroyed by that point. I mean, they've been at war since 1792 pretty much all the time. It's We're talking about over, you know, 20 or 23 years of continuous warfare. What country can still have strength after all of this? Uh, so, as I said before, even if by some chance he wins the day, in a few days or a week or a month, it's done. And I don't see any scenario where the Allies would leave him in control of even just France, you know, there, that's not happening. Maybe because they feared him, maybe because they wanted to be done with him. You can, you know, you can put your own point of view here, but it's just the Napoleonic adventure ends in eighteen in the summer of eighteen fifteen. By some, you know, if it's not in June, it's in July, but it ends there, and there is no way we're getting back on. And I'm still amazed that France even showed up at the Waterloo. Campaign. I mean, after those twenty odd years of warfare, those hundreds of thousands of deaths, those the country was invaded a year before. I mean, and and the capital was you know <laughs> marched on by Prussians and Russians. I mean, that's why we have the word bistro in Paris today because of the Russians saying bistre. <laughs> you know, uh, it uh, it left a quick impact. But it's you know they're done, and it's. You know, you flew too close to the sun and you got burned. Uh, go ahead, Marcus. Yes, well, I think it's all been really good points. And I think, you know, there's a reason we are on the same page. It, it, that Napoleon doesn't have much of a chance. And that's why I question his motives. But the bit we haven't mentioned of the Allies, the Allies, the Allies, is France itself. You know, you said um, it was 23 years of war. Well, then there's a lot of men of fighting age who are fighting who, you know, they're born into that war. They've known nothing since. Uh, and I just wanted to flag for, for French history podcast, you know, uh, the, the Vendée uprising. And, uh, you know, General Lamarck, who 
uh, for for many of us, we know from uh, Les Miserables, uh, really is is my point of reference of Lamarck's dead and the the, the start of some of the vacant music. Uh, but you know they're going in and putting down a French uprising, uh, and the Vendée's always been very difficult with its very pro Catholic and pro royalist. Um, but going in and you know fighting the French uprising who are fighting against Napoleon's return, and there's also a lot of um, of, of soldiers and officers, especially the officers, who uh, are either kind of apathetic or actually really against uh, Napoleon's return. And we do see uh, both brigade sized units and individual officers and men go and, and follow um, the King Louis. But yeah, I think just kind of thinking of actually could could Napoleon actually hold on? Well, he would he would have struggle with some of the the rural kind of Catholic ro- royalist uh, regions in the west and in the north would actually start to be kind of a bit of a, a pain in his own back door uh, as well as we know we know you know it's the benefit of hindsight um, of the fact that after Waterloo, you know, French Parliament showing that it doesn't really have that appetite for for war going on. So if if war carried on, even if there were, you know, close victories at Waterloo, and it would have been a close victory, as, as I said, it wasn't going to be a crushing victory by that point. Whatever had happened, even if some, many of the what ifs of history had changed, you know, did did France have the appetite to now fight a campaign in the Low Countries for the following months? I don't think they did, and especially not then. You're doing that, and could the war in the Vendée become even more brutal? We saw it in the late 1790s, where you know the the revolutionary governments were brutally oppressing um, the Vendée people. Uh, you know, they, again, you could. Uh, you could probably put the label of atrocities onto some of uh, onto some of that uh, sad passage of history. So uh, it is something that I don't think is uh, talked about enough. Certainly not in British speaking circles that we don't talk enough about the the French opposition uh, to Napoleon. So any opportunity to really highlight the facts, I think, is fascinating. It's a very good point. You know, and the Vendée uprisings are often cast aside in the French history, even in France. Let me reassure you, it's not an English thing only. And the worst thing is that in France, the Vendée uprisings are often used by very, I don't want to use a bad word, by very right-wing Catholic conservative parties in France that would promote a certain idea of France that might not be that modern, if you follow my thinking. And they're misusing history in that sense. Yeah, there was a film out very recently and I got very excited by the trailer because it was um, the Vendée uprising and it was uh, part of history that I think is definitely not talked about. I, I know it's not talked enough about that at all in Britain. Uh, so it's interesting it's not heard about enough in France. And I was really interested going and watching this uh, you know, my French is just about passable that I'd get the gist of some of it, but I'll be watching it with English subtitles. And it was slated as being sponsored by um, the far right uh, political parties in France. Part of me is still interested because it is a Napoleonic film. Um, but yeah, I have, I'm now taking it with a pinch of salt and I haven't kind of been brave enough maybe to go and uh, sit down and watch it with a, with maybe if I need a large pinch of salt, I need some tequila as well. But um, it's certainly very interesting that that, that that political agenda comes about. I say there's still a Bonapartist uh, party in France, so it's it is an active topic, and that, I think that shows how person our points all are. You know, I think everyone's had some really interesting points, and in if how history does affect you know French uh, history, but therefore you know Western European history as well. Yeah, well, you know, in France we still have monarchists, you have Bonapartists, you have all this stuff, even though we've been in a republic for a long time, and the French have a very weird idea of our republic and if you look at the republic that they they, we have the fifth republic is a very it's a republican monarchy i mean the president has more power than most uh heads of states have in the world it's been built by the goal for that very reason because the french were they wanted both ways they want a republic but they want a strong figurehead for the government they don't want a parliamentary system like uh, like you have in britain so it's it's very counterintuitive uh, the the way the Fr- the French see their own government. It is interesting to see <laughs> the the evolution of the the French system. Yes, Marcus. And, and yeah, if I may, you know, I think it's I think from an outside perspective, I think it is really interesting where you know it's a king of uh, France who brings back Napoleon's remains, and we sit today see uh, Macron, you know, this, this year going to Napoleon's tomb on the anniversary of his death. So that influence there. You won't see a French head of state say something bad about Napoleon, even not acknowledging the bad stuff that Mm. he did. Or they will do it, you know, 
very quietly because it's part of that national, as we said at the beginning, it's part of the national narrative. And you won't see many heads of state crush on that. You know, they, 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 they want you, they want to come face is that they don't want to diminish it in any way because they would diminish their own role. I've, I've seen, I've seen images of Macron and Napoleon as kind of AI 21st century in the same office, but during Napoleon, the anniversary of Napoleon's 200th death, um, or his, or his death, um, the, the only people who were criticizing Napoleon openly that I saw in international press was the, the French Socialist Party. All of the moderate parties, all of the right wing parties, you know, were, were, were very obviously very pro Napoleon. And I think that that speaks volumes. If there's, there's no criticism within those circles, you know, we certainly would have criticisms of most British uh, historical subjects. Uh, of that era and more recent. So yeah, it, they, uh, that is really interesting that they would come out and only say positives of head of state from then, you know, would anyone ever say anything negative about de Gaulle? There's, there's certainly negative things to say, but why do we not say it? Napoleon's a different level and uh, everyone around uh, this digital table tonight said something negative about him. Yeah, and, and it's also part of the the way the French politics work, you know, as I said, the national narrative in France is very figure centered. Like you won't, like the, for example, the far right uh, parties have used the figure of Jeanne d'Arc often, which is a nonsense, a complete historical nonsense. But what do you want? You know, it's, she's part of the national glory. So of course the nationalist party will use it, uh, use her. I mean, uh, Zach. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm entirely with you on that last point, Marcus, because from the UK side, um, Churchill is is the obvious one. Sure, Churchill gets a bit of criticism um, from the, the political left, but not much, not to the point where you'd see, for example, Keir Starmer, who's leader of the Labour Party, um, turning around and, and going, you know, Churchill was an idiot and, and you know, we should, we should all hate him and take down the statue in Parliament Square because Churchill has uh, rather like Napoleon sort of embedded himself into our national history through getting to, to write the history. Sure. Monumental contribution to Britain's survival during that conflict. But so I, I wouldn't entirely agree with, um, with what he said there. So before we go into the conclusion and goodbyes, are there any themes that have not been touched upon that you would like to talk about? Anything that's there to your heart? Philip, we, we barely talked about Marshall Blucher. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do that. Do um, but yeah, I, I plan to cover him in a future episode. But I, you know, I just don't think he gets enough credit for Waterloo. So we'll, we'll dive into that later on. Yeah. And I do have a question for you, Zach. Oui, Grouchy. <laughs> You've heard that one a couple times, I'm sure. <laughs> Ask Blucher. <laughs> That's what the answer is. You wanted to add something, Zach? Yeah, um, Uwe Grouchy. Well, he's he's precisely where Napoleon told him to be. That's that's the answer to that question. Um, so yeah, that's a, a myth that I perennially try and play whack a mole with without any degree of success because people don't want to listen to it. Um, they they like their uh, claim that it's all Grouchy's fault and missed the point that actually he was handed the orders a bit too late in the day um, and was doing what he was told. Um, there are whole podcast episodes on this, people. Just go and listen or pick up a book or do something other than just go, oh, it's all on Grouchy. Um, yeah, the, the other thing that I suppose would be nice to just kind of raise here is this idea that just because we've got different views to what other people think. And just because other people have different opinions doesn't mean that we're all idiots or we're wrong or we're biased or we're incapable of, of what we do. Um, and, and I say that as a professional historian, you know, somebody who's, who's done this for a decade. I'm, I'm always the first to say that, look, half the fun of this is that we disagree. Um, Marcus is probably more in the anti-Napoleon camp than I am. Not by much, because I'm, I'm not a particularly strong fan of Napoleon myself, but um, I think perhaps I'm, I'm a little bit further um, 
along the scale with that. But does that mean that Marx is an idiot who has just swallowed national propaganda and isn't entitled to um, voice his opinion and doesn't know what he's talking about? Well, judge that for yourself. You know, it's, it's, there is a need. That's Zach's polite way of saying no. <laughs> Uh, there is a S- same as me. I I, I was a bit positive about Na- Napoleon, but in the last weeks, I read I've read so much, so many books about that. So I'm getting absolute anti-Napoleonic. Now, this is the fun of it, right? That our positions shift over time. There was a time when I was far close to the Charles Esdale line of thinking. And if you're not familiar with the work of Charles Esdale, um, I don't think it's possible for Charles to have greater antipathy for Napoleon than, than he does. Um, and, and I've mellowed a bit, you know, there are, there are some things where I turn around and go, mm, yeah, well, okay. Um, still mostly negative, but this is the fun of it. And I think it's important for people to just recognize that history is about interpretation. It's not a science. And so as a, it's done an art, it's literally got a muse. I'm told, not that I really understood what a muse was when I was lectured on it at, at university, but we have a muse, apparently, good for us. And that kind of sense of people bringing different perspectives is what makes this enjoyable. And we need to listen to each other. And that's true of life, right, isn't it? But it's through the listening and by considering the whole of the evidence, not just the bits that fit our narrative, that we end up having a better understanding of what it is we're actually talking about and end up not looking like idiots. Well, hopefully we do not today. Marcus? Yeah, and I mean, following on, you know, are we always right? Zach says no, you know, Zach's frequently wrong and always incorrect. No, obviously, um, and we can, and we, the, what's really nice is uh, massively, yeah, Charles Esdale has influenced my thinking, you know, being, uh, being taught about Napoleon at quite a young thought, you just kind of see lots of bees on symbols on things and eagles and, and big wars in Russia really was the kind of uh, thing that we were presented. And that seemed okay. As Esdale's writing really influenced me to be, you know, challenging Bonaparte thinking rather than being anti-Bonaparte I would say I, I try to challenge it uh, I think the important thing is you know on one point sorry John uh, Napoleon's marshals were wrong uh, Napoleon is not France and I think the really important thing is by challenging Napoleon we are not challenging France or the French uh, maybe this is probably my, my, my closest similarity to, to Wellington I am very different to Wellington in every single manner however I agree with him that he he loved France. He he went to school in France, and uh, he he liked France, the French, the food, the wine, and it's something I can really um, sympathise with. You know, there is nothing greater a pleasure in life than French wine, really. And um, what we need to do is kind of respect each other's nations. That often social media it can become very uh, very heated about national pride, um, but we have to park. Napoleon and Wellington, not as the nations, uh, but as the people they represent. And I, what I like about this discussion and, and everyone brought to the table here, and it certainly frequently, it's actually people can be very civil and gentle about it. You know, uh, Zach and I can joke uh, because we're friends and uh, those kind of things. I know he's about to rip it out of me in the next moment. So I'm going to say something nice about him. So he looks, you know, more foolish with his web parte. Go ahead, Zach. See, Marcus is wrong. I wasn't about to rip it out. It's not all about you, Marcus. <laughs> there we go. I got a dig in there. Um, but Marcus and I work very closely with our, our charity work, so uh, we know each other very well. Um, it just struck me that one of the, the amusing things is we've all got our own anecdotes, I suspect, of times when we've been trolled. Um, and I'm, I'm very... Um, conscious of a, a good a friend of mine once saying that uh, opinions are like backsides. Everybody's got one. It's a question of how prominently you choose to display it. And I, I wonder what other people's experiences have been. You know, what's your worst troll that you've had? I mean, I, I was very struck that uh, Marcus was kind of emphasizing, look, I like France. I've been told that I'm anti-American because of reasons that I don't really understand. I produce a Napoleon Cause podcast and Apparently, I, I gravely insult the American people. Um, so sorry to American listeners. So you, you, you do get oddballs. Um, Marx and I have had exchanges with individuals who, who are just 
just not willing to engage a modicum of logic, you know, uh, the, the, the mentality of turning these battles into football matches as well. You know, Waterloo is, is Agincourt round two, we played away and we won 3-1, and you just think, shut up. People died in these things, you know, can you just grow up a little bit? But yeah, I'm just curious what other people's experiences have been, because Marcus, I know you've had some great ones uh, thrown your way. Yeah, and actually the weirdest ones I've had recently, because there's been a few, it, people, people seem to find us uh, for those topics and want to challenge. Um, the one that I'm always trying to represent, because uh, I've got lots of Irish friends and also the Duke of Wellington, is that Wellington was Anglo-Irish. And that is its own culture, its own people. And people too quickly to say Wellington was British, Wellington was English, or Wellington was Irish. And I've been really kind of found that lots of people said, oh, how dare you, you know, to claim that Wellington is not British or how dare you say that Wellington wasn't Ireland's greatest son. I was like, well, remember, he was born in Dublin, but you've got to remember his cultural background. And, Welling- and, and Ireland is very complicated with that. You know, it's not just Catholics and Protestants. There are subsets and the Anglo, the Anglo-Irish, uh, their own really important culture and history. And to, to ignore that is a bit like ignoring the Von D. You know, we are ignoring an own part and culture. Uh, and so that's probably the one that I'm finding the most of at the moment on, on trends, on, on unpleasant trends on social media. Um, and maybe it's because we've had a lot of Wellington's anniversary of Wellington's birth recently. Um, and that's one that I found a lot. And, and obviously, again, earlier, you know, being told that you're anti-French, which is just nonsense. Can't wait to go back on holiday to France, frankly. Um, love, love. If nothing else, it's not just the French wine. Uh, the French people and the countryside is just beautiful. The churches, the, the chateaus, um, and the fact it's very close to visiting the Waterloo battlefield helps. Um, but yeah, that seems to be, uh, the Wellington one seems to have been really prominent recently. Uh, yeah, if you're asking. As you very well said, Zach, you know, we were amongst relatively intelligent people, I think, and we try to share our knowledge. And, you know, we understand that we're going to have different perspectives. As I said at the beginning, we have all our own prejudices. We're not without them. We bring our experiences, our perspective, and that's fine. And that's the beauty of it. What do you think? I agree with uh, with what Zach was saying. I, you know, I do get trolled sometimes, but usually it's just, you know, people accuse me of being a fanboy of Napoleon. They'll say, you know, I listened to three episodes. I realized you're nothing more than a fanboy of a megalomaniac and a mass murderer. I'm not listening to any more episodes. And I always just say, well, thank you for listening to the three you did listen to. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, not sorry type of thing. But, you know, I appreciate it. It's still an engagement. So even if people listen to me to hate me, I, I have no problem with that. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to educate my listeners who really enjoy my podcast and, and, and want to learn more. And I like having great guests on. I like having uh, Emmanuel and, and Marcus on, and I hope to have Zach and Philippe on very soon. I I don't know. I I kind of I don't want to get too confident what I'm doing, so I kind of like criticism. So I don't know. I kind of take the good with the bad. I, I like. I'm not saying I like getting trolled, but I like when it's something I can use to make my podcast better. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. I would say though that if once I made a mistake, I wrote an error on Twitter. They won't let you hear the end of it. I recall I miss uh, I mistyped and I called John Lackland to be Richard the First son instead of brother. Oops, you know my bad. Sorry, guys. I had two English blokes who were just who would just not let me hear the and end. If you, of it. if you ever write like eighteen oh eight instead of eighteen oh nine, exactly. <laughs> typing if you've woken up in the morning exactly like yes. they people if everyone wants to be the smart person that points it out and you're just like yeah, genuinely we're all human we make a mistake you know yeah we're not perfect marcus and i were talking about the napoleon movie that's coming out soon and, and there's gonna be people who are like oh that's the wrong uniform or that regiment wasn't in that battle the important thing is they're bringing attention to the era so let's not get too carried away about the uniforms looking wrong or any of that kind of thing like just Sit back and enjoy the movie, please. I think we're, we're excited that there's a Napoleon movie coming out and a Napoleon series, aren't we? And we say, I, we saw it a lot with a, there was a whole string of World War I movies coming out and people really wanted to be like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and shouting about it. It's like, well, be excited there's World War I movies because if you say that they're all rubbish, they're going to not make it and they'll go back to making science fiction instead of something. Like, uh, I'm sure I'm not going to enjoy every moment of the Napoleon movie because I think it'll be 
I'm quite pro Napoleon, and it's no secret that I'm not. But like, we get in Napoleon movies, great. You know, yeah, I was actually shocked about that. Um, but we're getting Napoleon movies. It's great. You know, other than that, how how many have we had? We've had Master and Commander, Hornblower, Sharp, you know, and, and many iterations of War and Peace. We haven't had enough, uh, really. It was such a rich, and that's just, you know, one small section. How many other stories are there to tell? Um, yeah. I'm sure you know, John and I could well, let's start listing generals that we want a, a biopic around. But right, let's go. We'll be here all night. I know Zach has a point, but I just did an episode on Hortense, who talk about an interesting woman who was the stepdaughter of one emperor and the mother of another emperor and in between did some amazing things and arts and music and had a really interesting life so i think that you could make a movie just on hortense de borne sorry go ahead zach i'm i'm just bowled away by this idea that you know hollywood might not get the history right who would have thought it you know it's almost like these films are designed to entertain rather than to be documentaries that historians put together for people you know that there's there is that need sometimes to just suspend your disbelief and accept it's a different medium and it's not there to be granular and nerdy and i say that as an unashamed nerd of this period but you've got to accept something for what it is and if you're going to go into this wanting to nitpick about things that are going to be wrong you're going to need a very very large pad of paper and a, a very sharp pencil my friend because you're going to need you're going to be making a lot of notes you know it's just a given yeah, I completely agree. And if movies like Ridley Scott is doing that movie, so you know, if you take Gladiator or The Kingdom of Heavens, of course there's a lot of historical nonsense in them. But if it brought some kid to want to learn more of, about history, there you go. That's good enough for me, you know, because it's a spectacle and uh, it's shiny and uh, explosion. You have, you know, cannonballs that explode. Yeah. You know, all that stuff. You know, it looks good on the screen. And if people get interested in history because of it, Fine by me, you know. Uh, that's the whole point. That just Emmanuel. That if people can get interested in history because they've seen a film or a TV series or a book, let let's celebrate. I mean, how much you said the Gladiator? How much good was Gladiator have done for the uh, the Rome tourist board? You know, yeah. you go there and people start quoting Maximus Decimus Meridius, Command of the Day, et cetera, et cetera, and and people love that. So I, I can only imagine having a um no philip braveheart does not count it's still <laughs> awful um sorry in the group chat uh, there are exceptions to all and then mel gibson uh, and same goes to the patron and um <laughs> gonna get the nerd in me um and the, the, let, let's say you know i think you know uh, parisian tourism will do very well out of these tv series especially uh, and people will go to hotel in the Leeds and, and the museum of the army and that's a great thing if we can engage you know i, I was really lucky I, i've had a muse- i've had a career in heritage uh, and one of my first jobs was working at the tank museum down in uh, south of england bovington and when i was like 19 years old i had kids come in who played video games who knew more about the tanks of like the second world war than i could ever learn because they had been like playing call of duty world of tanks now that's their way into history fantastic you know zach and i got into it really because of sharp it, it's a nerd thing um self-acclaimed so great if this is the next generation fantastic it's just then that next going back to my original original point it's that next step napoleon's not all good so let's dive down to the history you know behind the scenes, the making of, okay, this ski, this scene, we happen to skip, you know, where he, he killed everyone in Jaffa. Um, so that doesn't make great Hollywood TV. So let's start to yeah, engage with those people, but not dismiss the films. No, no, let's enjoy them. Let's sit back and just suspend disbelief for, for two hours. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's like reading the Iliad, you know, let's just enjoy it. Do you side with the Greeks or the Trojans? Neither side is right, neither side is wrong. But, you know, read the book and, and judge for yourself. And same with this period. You know, do you think Napoleon did some great things? Do you you think he did some awful things? Just enjoy the moment and read read up on him. Or better still, listen to a podcast. (laughs) One of ours. Right, right. Shameless plug there. (laughs) There you go. Shameless. Generals Napoleon, yeah. It's a very good segue into the conclusion, actually. So before we uh, uh, leave, I would like each of you to tell my listeners where they could find you, where they could listen to you, podcast, social media, what have you. So, Philip, you go first. So, uh, you you find me best on Twitter. My uh, account is Pertinax S, and there you you can find me. You can you can you can write me, or you can read my tweets. And there I will depict 
that I depict usually Prussian history and German history in the Napoleonic age or in the Seven Years' War. So, welcome. Thank you. And Seven Years' War is very interesting to me as a French living in Canada. That's always a subject that I will try to tackle it by the end of the year on the podcast, by the way. Um, Marcus? Uh, thank you. Yes, so I suppose I do mostly hang out on uh, Twitter, where I'm at mcribhistory. Um, I do have a Facebook page, all things Wellington, the Valiant War channel. I need to change the name um, from Lockdown Projects, but I'm over there and we'll try to share things over. I've got a website, dukeofwellington.org, which uh, blogs bits and I need to update. I'm currently in the process of updating. And I'm, you know, I don't have a podcast. I don't um, have the time or, frankly, the skill um, to put one together. So I'm very lucky that I'm invited onto things like uh, Generals and Napoleon, like Napoleonic Wars slash Napoleonicist, uh, Red Coat History Podcast, and obviously now uh, Lafayette. So I really appreciate being invited onto those things. And I'm what I'm going to do on my website is, is list um, all of those ones so I can link back uh, to them. Uh, but yeah, I, I hang out on other people's podcasts and uh, something that I really enjoy doing and uh, enjoy the opportunity to do. So thank you again for that, Ashley. John? Yeah, I'm, so mine is Generals and Napoleon. Uh, I think we're at 41 published episodes so far. Um, try and put one out every nine days. Uh, Twitter, you can find us at Ann Napoleon. And there's a couple other podcasts that are really good. If <laughs> if you listen to all the ones on this show and you don't like any of ours, uh, Age of Napoleon is good. History Rage is really good. Uh, there's a great one on Frederick the Great. I think it's The Life and Times of Frederick the Great, which is nicely done. Um, so if you're just looking for this era, there's so much really great information out there. I think Red Coat, British Red Coat History is another one. There's just a ton of great, great podcasts out there if you're interested in this era. Yeah, the, the Life and Times of Red Coat Great is made by Alec Avdakov. I've done an episode with him on uh, Voltaire in Prussia last year on my, uh, my show. And very, very nice guy and a very good podcaster. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach? Sure. I mean, I've spoken far too much already this evening, so... Um... People probably won't want to hear more of me, but I'm on Twitter at Zed White History. You've heard already um, that I run the Napoleonic Wars podcast. I don't know how many episodes we're on now, 170, 80, 90 odd, um, a lot, too many. People are still tuning in, it baffles me. Um, if you have an interest in sort of dabbling a bit more in the period, then I run a website, the NapoleonicWars.net, which has a forum attached to it where people kind of share their views, but forums these days die and breed. Um, and I'm probably spending most of my time these days working with the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity, which is an organisation that I set up in 2021 that basically sees, um, seeks to honour the war dead, uh, whether that's with restoring their graves to turn those graves into sites of memory, uh, whether it's educating people about the period through evening talks and, and study days, but also crucially burying veterans. You know, we, we try to put forward this idea that maybe we should give the war dead from this period a little bit more respect and rather than putting them on display and treating them as sort of quaint little artifacts, maybe we can just give them the dignity of a marked place in the ground so that they truly can rest in peace. So if any of that's of interest, uh, we are on Twitter at NRWG Charity. And the website is www.nrwgc.com. Marcus, you have something to add? So I pressed that one. I didn't think Zach was going to give the NRWGC uh, Twitter handle a plug. Uh, so fantastic. Yeah. And if I can just reiterate uh, Zach's points there. Uh, and I know uh, John and Philip uh, support the cause, which is uh, really appreciated because uh, the NRWGC is a charity. So a shameless plug for a charity which feels okay to do right at the end because it's honoring the legacy of those who served and fell uh, from this era and you know ultimately they are the napoleonic wars so there was uh, much service and suffering that should be uh, rightly dignified by uh, this fantastic cause that we've um, got going so any any interactions donations uh, memberships are always really gratefully received thank you perfect well monsieur gentlemen meine herren Thank you very much for coming over on my podcast, my humble platform. I really appreciate it. It's it's just been great, you know, having that talk with the four of you. Really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. And I'm pretty sure the listeners will enjoy the episode. So thank you for listening. Au revoir. 
you can find the Lafayette We Are Here podcast wherever you get your podcasts or on lafayettepodcast.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash lafayettepodcast. You can also reach me on social media or by email. All the links are on the website. The music for this podcast is the Marche pour la Cérémonie des Turcs, composed by Jean-Baptiste Lully, arranged and performed by Jérôme Arfouche. Thank you.